the end times, we're going to look at the timeline tonight and what is about to happen. And we're going to try to kind of piece together the puzzle that is the end time. But especially as we see the regathering of Israel and Judah, looking at the regathering of Israel and Judah into their land, all 12 tribes, our clock, our timepiece, our calendar for the end is the nation of Israel. And you know, I've heard it said before that Israel is is the clock uh, and Jerusalem is, is the second hand. <laughs> Jerusalem is really the one to keep our eye on. So right now with everything that's happening in Jerusalem with the rockets going into Jerusalem, um, we really do need to be paying very close attention because all of these things are building up um, what the Bible said it would be like with Jerusalem being that burdensome stone in the last days. So Israel is our timepiece. And uh, when the disciples came to Jesus and they asked him, what is the sign? You know, here Jesus was telling them about the end of the age. And they said, what is the sign of the end of the age? What is the sign of these things? And so he told them a lot of things that would be happening at the end. But then he gave them the sign. He said, learn the parable of the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender, and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. Even so, you too, when you see all these things, and all these things was what he had told them before about wars, rumors of wars, pestilences, um, earthquakes in diverse places, all, all those um, apostasy getting worse. He, he told them all those things beforehand. So when you see all these things, recognize that he is near, right at the door. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all of these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So Jesus here gives this parable of the fig tree, and he states that the generation that sees all these things that we're seeing right now in, in concert with the rebirth of the nation of Israel won't pass away. Until. So the rebirth of Israel was in 1948. It shall come to pass that in that day, the Lord shall shut his, set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of the people who are left. Remember, he's a second time he is regathering Israel. He will set up a banner for the nations and will assemble the outcasts of Israel and will gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. And so this is not just Judah, but Israel and Judah coming back. Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Shall a nation be born at once? And Israel was born in one day. She came to being in May 14th, 1948 in one day. For as soon as Zion travel, um, travailed, she brought forth her children, Isaiah 66, 8. So we see here the... Uh, we are right now living in amazing times because here the nation of Israel and that has happened in, in our basic generation. You know, we, uh, this wasn't a sign that a hundred years ago people had to look forward to the rapture. They did not have Israel. They didn't have the timepiece and we have the timepiece now. So everything is in light of Israel. And then the reclaiming of Jerusalem was in 1967. And this picture right here was just from, I think, yesterday. This was, um, there was a fire on the Temple Mount. Uh, the, um, there was a tree, I believe, on the Temple Mount that was set fire from fireworks. And, uh, and so the rockets and everything that was going on yesterday, uh, this is actually a picture there of the Temple Mount on fire, which is just very prophetic picture. So, and they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive to all nations. This is, of course, when Israel was dispersed. And Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And so, Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. So, we actually are seeing a picture of 
right now, Jerusalem being trampled by Gentiles right now. And this is going to be until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. So that was a major sign in 1967 when Jerusalem came actually underneath the leadership and the ownership of Israel. And um, and so we'll see here in you know in the in the time to come when they're able to rebuild their third temple. And uh, but all of this is is we're coming on the the edge of the time of the Gentiles, you know, the time of the Gentiles is, is about to be fulfilled. So what are some other things that we're seeing um, as we are coming up to the, uh, the end of the story? There's these uptick in birth pains. And I also saw an interesting article and it was by a rabbi and I forget his name right now, but he's, he's an unbelieving rabbi. Um, and he described what's happening right now on the Temple Mount as a birth pain leading up to the Messiah. Now he's not looking for Jesus. He's looking for the first coming of their Messiah. We of course are looking for Jesus, um, but he called it a birth pain. And so it is a birth pain. And as birth pains go, they get worse and they get closer together as you get closer to the birth of the baby. And so wars and rumors of wars, there's always been wars, there's always been rumors of wars. You can't go an hour without hearing about a war, without hearing about a threat right now, especially everything super tense with Russia, everything super tense with Iran, um, with, with China, there's all this posturing. Um, with the, the pipeline that, you know, everybody's out of gas right now uh, and, you know, who caused it, it, you know, looks like it could have been done by a na nation state. There's all this wars and rumors of wars. Um, earthquakes, earthquakes are increasing in, in severity and they're increasing all over the world in frequency. Also weird weather. I think we all can understand that every single year is an unprecedented weather event and um, apostasy. We see this happening um, all over. Things have just gone absolutely crazy that moving away from the things of God and, and leaving uh, the things of God. So with all that in mind, what is the next major prophetic event that we can expect to see? Now we can expect to see upticks in birth pains. We can accept, expect to see more things like we're seeing right now in Israel, which are prophetic events. But they are all setting up and leading toward things that are most likely really going to be happening during the tribulation. The next prophetic event on God's calendar that we're seeing here, as far as the end times goes, really is the rapture of the church. And so um, we are not looking for the Antichrist, we're looking for Jesus Christ. You know, that's, that's the one that we're looking for. And so the rapture of the bride is the next prophetic event, um, big major prophetic event that we're going to see. And so we, we will be kept from, we will be rescued, we will be escaped from the tribulation period. And here in Revelation, Jesus himself tells us, because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I also will keep you from the hour of testing that the that that hour which will come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. And so Jesus here is telling us he's going to keep us from the tribulation period. He's going to keep us from that time that's going to come on those that do not know him. Who is raptured? Um, in 1 Thessalonians, uh, Paul tells us, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. And so who's going to be raptured? All the dead in Christ, which is a, a, just an, a number that can't even be counted. And all of this, all of us right now who are alive and remain that are in Christ will be raptured at the rapture. So it's not, this also is not about works. This is about who belongs to him, who actually has a relationship with him, 
are those that will be raptured. And so what's next for the bride? You know, we're going to look at the full tribulation period and what happens after that. But first, we're going to look at what is what's next for us. You know, the immediate next thing that that um, that is imminent is, of course, the rapture. But after the rapture, what are we going to be experiencing? And so there's going to be the judgment seat, the Bema seat judgment of the church. And so everyone undergoes judgment, whether you are in Christ or you are not in Christ, but praise God <laughs> for the bride. Our judgment is not on our dead sins because our dead sins have been removed from us. Remember, Jesus has completely paid for those. They are as far removed from us as the East is from the West. They never touch. They are completely removed from us. So our judgment is not on the works that we've done in the flesh, our judgment is done on what we have done in Jesus. And so we're our, our deeds that we have done for the body are the things that are going to be judged. And so whether or not we did something to serve him or we did it out of our own selfish motivation. And so this is the this is the judgment that we'll have. And it's similar to an award ceremony at, 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 a, at the games. An award ceremony um, is the, the picture here that you get. So it's like trophies, crowns that we'll have. So now if any man builds on the foundation, the foundation is Jesus. He is the foundation. We're not building on anything else but him. So if we build on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident. So that day will show because it will be revealed with fire and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work, which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. So our work will be tried. If it was something that we did truly out of Jesus, then we'll receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, if it was just our selfish motivation, if it was just us doing it for our own purposes, then we'll suffer the loss of that deed because it won't matter. But he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. So we may not have, you know, if everything, if we just got saved, but we never did anything for him, maybe we got saved at the very end of our life and we don't have any works to show, we're still going through we still belong to him, but we won't have the rewards. We won't have the crowns. We won't have um, those blessings that those that have worked for him and strived for him and he served through us will have. So then the marriage supper of the lamb. So we have this wonderful award ceremony where we are in front of him and he brings to mind the things that he did through us. And, and there'll be rewards for that. And then there's the marriage supper of the lamb. And this um, seems to occur sometime after the Bema judgment, but before we return as his bride, because we're going to have this marriage supper of the lamb. The full marriage ceremony will be complete because when we come back with him, we're coming back with him as his bride. So this marriage supper of the lamb is going to happen um, during that time. So let's rejoice and be glad and give glory to him for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready, right? Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb. So we are blessed because we are part of the marriage supper of the lamb. And during these seven years, we will be with Jesus and we'll be worshiping him. We'll be getting to know him. We'll have We'll have time with our brothers and sisters in Christ that, that have passed away or those that we, we've never even known. We'll, we'll have this wonderful fellowship time together. But meanwhile on earth, the tribulation is unfolding. So we've got what we're experiencing in the heavenlies. And you can see a little bit of this when you look at the book of, um, we see a good bit of it actually, when you look at the book of, um, of Revelation, because John is seeing the tribulation unfold from heaven's perspective. So there's lots of pictures of what's happening in heaven. There's the marriage supper of the lamb. Um, so there's a lot of pictures there of the heavenly perspective, but then you also see what's going on on earth during that time. So 
the Antichrist is revealed. Now, this is going to be, um, this is, this may happen simultaneously with the beginning of the seven years, or, or maybe it'll happen a little bit before where people will be able to maybe piece together who he is. I do believe scripture says that he will not be revealed until after the church is gone because we are what is restraining him, the Holy Spirit in us. So uh, Paul tells us here, and you know what restrains him, the Antichrist now, so that in his time, he will be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. Then the lawless, the lawless one will be revealed from whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring an end by the appearance of his coming. So the Antichrist will be revealed after we are raptured and he is going to be in play and he's going to be in charge and he's uh, going to have a short time of ruling until Jesus comes back. And when Jesus comes back, he's going to destroy him when he, with the breath of his, of his return. So it may be that he is revealed when he confirms the covenant with many, um, or maybe he'll be able to figure it be figured out who he is before then. But, uh, So the first half of the tribulation, the start of the tribulation period, the commencement of the tribulation period is that 70th week of of Daniel. So it commences with the covenant with many. That is what starts this final week. Remember the 70 weeks of Daniel, 69 of those weeks have already been fulfilled. They were fulfilled through Jesus. And then he was cut off and now God has pressed pause. So, um, you know, on the 70 weeks of Daniel, a video that really explains it, but now God has pressed pause on Israel through this time of the Gentiles. And until the time of the Gentiles is complete, they've been blinded in part. And so when we're raptured up, the time of the Gentiles is complete and now God's full attention is going to be back on Israel. And that last week, that last um, heptide, that last seven years is going to be able to commence. And so this is a period that is called Jacob's trouble. It's all about Israel. So here in Jeremiah, it says how awful that day will be. No other will be like it. And that day is this, is this time period. It will be a time of trouble for Jacob but he'll be saved out of it. You know, the tribulation period is going to be very, very hard. This is, this is wrath on earth. This is God's wrath poured out on earth. But the purpose of this is to save the nation of Israel. The purpose of this time is to, is to cleanse the earth and to save the nation of Israel out of it. God's full attention goes back and he finishes what he started with her. And it's like in Daniel, it's to complete this. It's to fulfill this with Israel. So she will be saved out of it. And that day declares the Lord Almighty, I will break the yoke off their necks and I will tear off their bonds. No longer will foreigners enslave them. This is about Israel. Instead, they'll serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. Jeremiah. And so we see David here. We see David here later during the um, during the millennial reign. He'll he'll be he'll be king. He'll he'll be restated, um, and he'll actually be be reigning uh, with Jesus and with us during that time. So the last seven years or this week of Daniel begins with the covenant with many. So this covenant with many will begin this last seven year count. And here in Daniel it says, and he, the Antichrist, will make a firm covenant with many for one week. So I think a good candidate for the coming covenant with many is the Abraham Accords. Um, the name itself is interesting. Abraham. Here, God chose Abraham. Out of Abraham, he chose Isaac. Out of Isaac, he chose Jacob. Jacob. This right here is trying to change God's covenant. His covenant is with 
Jacob with Israel. And so right here, we have a covenant with many until, until here, there was um, just Egypt and Jordan in the past. I don't want to say the years wrong, but it was just Egypt and Jordan that had covenants with Israel until last year. And now they're continuing to come into the Abraham Accords. And just this past, uh, I believe it was Thursday or Friday, Jared Kushner um, announced that they have opened the Abraham Accords Center for Peace. And so this is continuing to progress and continuing to move forward. And then along with what's going on in Jerusalem right now with the rockets, we can see we can see both sides of what is facing Israel in, in, in the coming uh, in times. We see the covenant with many forming, and we also see the Gog Magog coalition forming. And so it's very interesting days to see these things um, really dancing and, and playing off of each other. We can see this more and more how these, what they actually have to do with one another. And uh, so this is probably going to be also really key in rebuilding the third temple because uh, already some of these nations have stated uh, that they would like for the third temple to be rebuilt, which is incredible. So all the pieces are, are falling in line with that. So whether or not the um, Gog Magog invasion happens before the covenant with many or the covenant with many happens first, I am, we're, we don't really know. Um, it could actually be that the covenant with many happens first and that provokes them because right now that seems to be the case. The, um, the Abraham Accords have provoked the Palestinians to feel like they are in such a corner that they are lashing out right now during Ramadan. And we see that with Iran. Um, there, it, it's provoking them to be more violent because they're not being heard and they feel like they've been, they feel like they've been left behind by their brothers. And uh, so it, it makes sense that it may be the Gog Magog invasion that um, will happen right after the covenant with many is signed. And, uh, but it could, it could, ha it could happen either way. So um, also it looks like toward the first half, this could even happen before we're raptured, but um, I kind of think this is gonna happen after, but this could actually happen before we're raptured. We could see these things happen. As far as the Gog Magog invasion, not the covenant with many. The covenant with many will be, will be raptured when that happens because we're not here when the Antichrist is revealed is my understanding. So here 38 and 39, and the word of the Lord came to me saying, this is to Ezekiel, son of man, set your face toward Gog, the land of Magog, and this is Russia, the prince of Rosh, Meshesh, and Tubal, and prophesy against them. This right here is Turkey, and Turkey is also very angry right now at Israel. And they are um, confirming their uh, coalition more with, uh, with Iran and Russia. Thus says the Lord, behold, I am against you, Gog, Prince of Rosh, Mishash, and Tubal, and I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you out, and all your army, horse, horses and horsemen, all of them, speedily attired and clothed in full armor, a great company with buckler and shield, and all of them wielding swords, Persia, um, and that, of course, is, is Russia, and Cush, and put with them, all of them, with shield and helmet, Gomer with all of his troops, Beth Targama <laughs> with the remote parts of the north with all of its troops, many people with you. So they are going to come into Israel and, um, and, it, and it says that they'll be coming in to, to take a spoil too. They're gonna be taking this opportunity um, for, for the economy as well to take the oil, um, the pipeline that's going through there. So therefore prophesy son of man and say to God, this is the Lord, God, on that day when the people of Israel are living securely, and see, that could be that covenant with many, that Abraham Accords that's giving Israel a sense of security, that you will not know it. You will come from your place out of the remote parts of the north, you and many people with you, 
all of them riding on horses, a great assembly and a mighty army. And you'll come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. And it shall come about in the last days. See, this is the last days that I will bring you up against my land so that the nations may know me and I am sanctified through you before their eyes, O God. So God is going to show himself through this. He is going to defeat these armies in a supernatural way. In a way that similar to 1967, the, um, the war where, where they took Jerusalem, it was, it was a God thing. It was a completely God thing. So um, he's going to do something like that again. And so also at the first half of the tribulation, there's a lot that happens right here at the beginning. There's the covenant with many. There's the unrest. There are the two witnesses that um, will be revealed or would be revealed right at the beginning of the tribulation period because they're going to be there for 1260 days. So they're going to be there for three and a half years. So they begin their ministry and they prophesy for the first three and a half years of the tribulation. So they will be helping to rebuild the temple, I believe, because um, even rabbis today are saying that they need, they need um, Elijah to come and tell them to, to answer some questions for the rebuilding. That they, that they need him. And so when Jesus said, yes, Elijah will come before the great and terrible day of the Lord, uh, you know, this is one of these two witnesses most, uh, most scholars believe will be Elijah. And so they'll come and restore, help restore all things. So here in Revelation, it says, leave out the court, which is the outside of the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the nations. And they will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months. So for three and a half years, the, um, the nations will be there just, just like we see right now. They're, they're um, on the Temple Mount. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses. And they will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. And so we see here the two witnesses will be witnessing and will be proclaiming the truth and, and trying to explain to people what's happening during that that first three and a half years of the tribulation. And so during those first three and a half years, the third temple is also going to be rebuilt. And so right now they have, they really have everything in place to rebuild it. Um, they've got all the plans, uh, mil spent millions of dollars on the plans. Um, the Temple Institute has recreated all the, all the pieces to go inside of it. They even say that they know where, the Ark of the Covenant is. So they say that they have everything. They just need permission to do it. So it may be that covenant with many gives them the permission to rebuild and they and they rebuild the temple during those first three and a half years uh, because there has to be the temple in order for the Antichrist to go in and declare himself God in the Holy of Holies and stop the sacrifices. The sacrifices had to have had to have um, been happening. So sacrifices are happening right now, but they are, um, of course, not on the Temple Mount. They're as close as they can be to it, and they're they're trying to do things in in practice. They're they're training up the Kohen. They're they're doing all that and uh, preparing themselves for when they can do it in the Temple. So toward the middle the abyss is going to be opened. So if there wasn't already some weird, obvious, demonic activity going on during the first half of the tribulation, this is when it's going to start. This is, this is, um, this is very hard to understand exactly <laughs> what this is going to be outside of something demonic happening. So um, here we have the fifth angel sounded the trumpet. This is in Revelation. I saw a star. This is an angel falling from heaven to earth, and he has a key to the pit of the abyss. Now, the abyss is an actual place on earth. Um, remember when Jesus was talking to the man who had lesion inside of him? He had a lesion of demons inside of him, and the demons begged him, please do not send us to the abyss. 
whatever you do, don't send us to this place. And so he sent them into the pigs and they ran off the, the course. Here, this abyss is filled with demonic entities. Um, the star opened. And so this angel opens the pit of the abyss and smoke arose from it like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke from the pit. And out of the smoke, locusts descended on the earth. And they were given power like scorpions of the earth. And they were told not to harm the grass or the earth or any plant or tree, but only those who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. So they were only allowed to heal those who God has is not claiming to be his. Um, now we know that during this first, um, another thing that happens during this first three and a half years is God seals the 144,000 um, of the 12 tribes of Israel. So he, he, he seals 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel to be um, evangelists, to go forth and, and proclaim him. And he seals them on their foreheads. And there may be others that are, that are sealed as well, but we know those are. So these are given the power to, to harm anyone that does not belong to God, that does not have his seal on them. The locusts were, were not given power to kill them, but only to torment them for five months. And their torment was like the stinging of a scorpion. In those days, men will seek, women will seek death, but they won't be able to find it. They'll long to die, but death will escape them. And that's, an, and that's interesting too, what's causing them from being able to die if they want to. Um, and the locusts look like horses prepared for battle. These are not locusts. This is something else. With something like crowns of gold on their heads and faces like the faces of men. They had hair like that of women and teeth like those of lions. And they also had thoraxes like breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was like the roar of many horses and chariots rushing to battle. They had tails with stingers like scorpions, which had the power to injure people for five months. And they were ruled by a king, the angel of the abyss. And his name in Hebrew is Abaddon and in Greek, Apollyon. So this is the first woe and behold, two woes are still to follow. Now, this is very interesting and you guys may not be aware of this, but there is a lot of, um, of uh, pagan um, in, in high places that do ceremonies on a regular basis trying to raise Apollyon. So this is very, very interesting because there are... Um, there is an active effort to raise this demon that will be raised during the tribulation. It's absolutely amazing. Um, this is destruction. That is what his name means. The angel of destruction. This is, this is not um, a ruler of an army of some kind. Sometimes we try to uh, take this and mean that these are, that these creatures are, are somehow a war that's happening. This is actually a, these are actually something demonic that's coming on the earth at this time and it's ruled by an actual demon that has been kept in the abyss all this time a very these are very dangerous demons that have been confined to this pit for these last days and so this continues because here they are released and they're they're causing all this kind of havoc okay now we're at the midpoint of the tribulation. We're at the three and a half year mark of the tribulation. And the two witnesses have been proclaiming this entire time from Jerusalem. The two witnesses are killed right here at the midpoint of the tribulation. They, when they finish their testimony, so God has an appointed amount of time that they're supposed to testimony at three and a half years after exactly 1260 days of their testimony, the beast that comes out of the abyss, Apollyon, that demonic entity is going to make war with them and overcome them and kill them. So the very same beast that comes out of the abyss kills them. At this point, this is all happening, bam, bam, bam. The Antichrist goes into the Holy of Holies and declares himself God. In the middle of the week, three and a half years, 
he, the Antichrist, will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of the abominations will come one who makes desolate, even into a complete destruction. One that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. So here the Antichrist is going to stop the sacrifices and he's going to go in and he's going to say, I'm God. Now the two witnesses, they don't stay dead. They lay in the streets for three and a half days. There's something about the three and a half. Three and a half years, they're proclaiming God. Three and a half days, they are laid dead in the street. And it's three and a half days where the entire world, and this is something that just in recent years is even able to happen. The entire world will be able to witness their death, witness their dead bo bodies laying in the streets for three and a half years. I mean, three and a half days. They'll be able to witness this, give each other presents. They'll be sending Amazon presents to one another during these three and a half days. So happy that these people that have plagued them are dead. But after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God will come into them. So they will see these that have been dead for three and a half days. They will see them stand on their feet and great fear will fall among those who are watching them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And then they went up to heaven in the cloud and their enemies watched them. The enemies are able to watch them die, watch them lay in the streets. They'll also watch them arise and ascend to heaven. All this happening at the same time. At this same exact time, there's going to be an earthquake. Think about this, the warning that God gives here. They're dead in the street for three and a half days. People, if they actually open up their Bibles to see, hold on a minute. I think I've heard this before. They're going to be told that after they rise, there's going to be a severe earthquake. God gives them a warning about this. So at the same time that they rise, there's going to be an earthquake that destroys one-tenth of Jerusalem and kills 7,000 people. And in that hour, there was a great earthquake. And a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake. And the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. So this is interesting here to note too, okay? This is Jerusalem. 7,000 people are going to die. The rest were terrified and gave glory to God. That is different than what we're about to see. Everywhere else, when God talks about the, the plagues that are coming on the earth, he again and again says, and they cursed God and they would not repent. Here you see in Jerusalem, here you see in Israel, the here the, the the people in Israel they are being saved out of the tribulation this is they are realizing this is their messiah you see the contrast with the rest of the world that is continuing to grow more cold Israel is seeing that this is God so the antichrist the rest, the great tribulation, the next three and a half years, the last three and a half years, that's the great tribulation. The Antichrist has authority to rule over earth. So the first three and a half years, he's building his authority. He's winning the people. He goes in, he says, I'm God. And he is given authority. This beast that comes out, this Antichrist, he is given authority for three and a half years for 42 months. He's given authority. He's and he is blaspheming God. He's blaspheming the name of God. He's blaspheming his tabernacle and he's blaspheming those who dwell in heaven. He's talking about us. We're those that dwell in heaven. He's spreading lies about what happened with the rapture three and a half years before, still. He's continuing to do that. And so here he's, he's blaspheming God and everything that's of God. He's trying to spin that delusion still. 
Now here at this time, here Jesus warns, he, he tells that this is going to happen, this, this, um, this at this three and a half year mark, that um, therefore when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, here Jesus is warning here in Matthew 24 when he talks about the end. He says, when you see that standing in the holy place, when you see the Antichrist declare himself to be God, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Here, Jesus said, when you see this happen, run. And so we see here, Israel, when this happens, they realize and God protected them and God shields them. And so we see here God taking his people and he's taking care of them and he's protecting them, similar to how he did in the Exodus. He's going to protect them. And so we see here in, in Revelation 12, it, it tells this the same story, but from a different point of view, from a different angle. Um, and a lot of people believe that those mountains that have been prepared for them are actually Petra. And uh, there have been... Uh, um, mission trips that have gone to Petra that have taken scores and scores of Bibles and have hid them for the Jews one day when they run to Petra for protection and God protects them. They've hidden scores and scores of Bibles um, there in, uh, in, in Petra. So a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun. This is the Revelation 12 sign with the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head. And she was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and 10 horns and seven crowns on its heads. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky. You know, Satan has taken a third of the angels, fallen angels, and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. You know, the enemy wanted to, wanted to take Jesus the whole time. You know, he wanted to stop his birth. He tried to kill all the baby boys. But I think there's actually even more to this than we realize. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. Her child was snatched up to God and his throne. That's interesting because this word snatched is harpazo. It's the same word that we use for rapture. It is, he was raptured up. He was harpazoed up to God. Jesus didn't harpazo. He ascended. They watched him. He wasn't snatched up suddenly as to out of danger. The bride will be harpazoed. So it's interesting here that this could actually be talking about us, that God rescues us out right before the enemy is wanting to take us. And the woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1260 days for the remainder of the tribulation period. So there's 1260 days for the first half and there's 1260 days for the second half because there are the God is going back to his biblical 360 day years. 360 days for uh, I mean 12 so 1260 days so that's going to be from the mid trib to when Jesus returns. He is going to take care of this remnant that he protects. And so Israel is fleeing and she escapes the dragon. So the tribulation saints, because the dragon is not like, oh, well, I can't get to her now. He hasn't, he moves on. So he will speak out against the most high and wear down the saints of the highest one. And he will intend to make alterations in times and in the law. And they'll be given into his hand for a time, times and a half a time. So this again is the Antichrist having power and authority for those final three and a half years. 
and the tribulation saints will be given over to him. Now notice, Israel is not given over to him. Israel is told, flee to the mountains and God will supernaturally protect you. But the tribulation saints, they will be given over to him. They will be uh, decapitated for their faith. And so now we, we, can, we continue the story here with the two signs from Revelation 12. When the dragon saw that he had been hurled to earth, he pursued the woman. So he goes after Israel, who had given birth to the male child. The woman was given two wings of a great eagle. And that is the same terminology that's used of Israel being um, in the Exodus, being given wings of a great eagle and going into the wilderness. That's the same terminology that was used in the Exodus. So that she might fly to a place prepared for her in the wilderness where she would be taken care of for a time, times, and a half a time, again, where she'll be taken care of for 1260 days. Out of the serpent's mouth, um, out of the serpent's reach. And then from the serpent's mouth, he spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away. But the earth helped the woman by opening up his mouth and swallowing the river the dragon had spilled out of his mouth. So again, God supernaturally protects Israel using water like he did in the Exodus. <laughs> and then the dragon was enraged at the woman. You know, he's so mad he can't get to her. He can't get to Israel. He can't stop God's plan with Israel. So what does he do? He goes to war and war um, and rage against the rest of her offspring, against the tribulation saints, against the rest of those that are not Israel, but they're those that after were raptured come to receive Jesus as their savior. And so he goes after them, those who kept God's covenant and the testimony of Jesus. And so we see here what the Antichrist is doing during that time. And so at this time, after he declares he's God, he also sets up the mark of the beast. So he sets up a way of worship and a way that people can be marked to him. You know, you notice how um, the plagues aren't, aren't hitting those that are marked for God. So the Antichrist tries to do his counterfeit. God marks his people. Well, so Satan wants to mark his people. You know, he's a counterfeiter. So he sets up this mark of the beast, which is an act of worship. Um, and he causes all, everyone, to receive this mark of ownership. It's, it's a mark that means that they belong to the Antichrist and not God. Just like when we belong to God, we're marked for him. The Holy Spirit marks us for him. Well, the Antichrist will have this counterfeit mark. And it's going to be on their right hand or on their foreheads. Um, and no one will be able to buy or sell during this time without it. It'll be their only way to be a part of society, buy and sell. They won't, you know, so it may be something to do with a, uh, with the economy. Maybe it'll be completely uh, digital currency. Um, but whatever it will be, people will not be able to be a part of the economy. They will not be able to be a part of life, won't be able to work, won't be able to buy or sell unless they have this mark. Um, and it's interesting here, too, on the right hand or on the forehead in, you know, God said to to put his word on your hand and and on your forehead and and that's that where everything you do you know with your hand if, you, if you've got something on your hand you're always reminded with everything that you do and if something's on your forehead you're always reminded with everywhere you look because it's in your peripheral in both places and so you see the the counterfeit that the enemy tries to do here with the mark of the beast and so the last part of the tribulation here we see god's wrath increase now, it's bad enough, the wrath of the Antichrist that's going out um, on all the people with the mark of the beast and his tyranny. But God is unleashing his wrath. He is trying to allow people to see that he is God. He's trying to get attention of everyone before the end. And so... His bowl of wrath, his bowls of wrath. There's um, seven of those. They're in Revelation 16. The first one is boils. And those only go on those that take the mark of the beast. So it may even be that there's something in the mark 
that causes them to get sick from these. Um, but there's boils that only happen to those that have taken the mark of the beast. The second bowl is the sea is turned to blood and all the sea life die because of it. The third bowl are the rivers are then turned to blood. And so it goes on to say that because they spilled the blood of God's people, he gave them blood to drink. And then the fourth bowl, the sun, something happens with the sun where it intensifies and people are burned with intense heat. And, you know, here, you know, we saw here when the earthquake happened that Israel repented, that Israel said, God, they praise God. Here, when the sun is burning the people, the people curse God and they would not repent. You see the heart of the people. They dig their heels in further, knowing full well that this is God Almighty. They dig their heels in. The fifth bowl is darkness. So darkness over the entire land. And it goes on to say that the people are gnashing their teeth in pain. They're in pain from the boils. It, it says that they're in pain from the boils and they're in darkness and they continue to curse God and not repent. The sixth bowl is that the Euphrates is dried up for the kings of the east and God gathers all the kings and all the warriors for Armageddon. So he's got, he's gathering them all up, bringing them all to Armageddon for, for his return and to put an end to this. So the seventh bowl is a great earthquake that divides Israel into three parts. And it collapses the cities of the nations. It says all the nations, all their cities are collapsed. And it actually changes the, um, it changes the, the structure of the world that mountains are made low and valleys are made into mountains. So it's a complete, um, it's the worst, it's an earthquake unlike any earthquake that's ever been that actually affects the entire world. And, um, and it goes on to say that Babylon the Great is remembered at that time. So if Babylon the Great is not destroyed prior to that, she's destroyed at that earthquake. But I, it seems like she's destroyed prior to that. So Jesus' second coming with his bride at his side. So we see all this. The bowls are, are all building up to the end, to where this is it. Jesus is going to come back with the deed to earth and he's going to take power and he's going to reign and uh, take and start his his um, millennial reign. So it starts with Armageddon. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, that's Satan, and out of the mouth of the beast, the Antichrist, out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs. So we see these demonic entities coming out of them for their spirits of demons performing signs which go out of the kings of the world to gather them together for war of the great day of God, the almighty. And they gathered them together to the place which in the Hebrew is called Armageddon. So we see here the armies of the world gathering together at Armageddon to battle God to go against Jerusalem, to go against God's, God's city. And I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he who sat on it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and wages war. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. Jesus is the word of God and the armies which are in heaven, that's us, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. We're following him on white horses. This is where we come back on our horses. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him. They were actually thinking they could battle Jesus. I mean, this is just crazy. So they were wanting to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And it does not work out for them. So Jesus returns to fight for Israel and he splits the Mount of Olives from east to west. Mount Olives is, um, is bisected from east to west, forming a large valley. And the Lord 
will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights in the day of battle. And that day his feet will stand on Mount Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west by a very large valley so that half the mountain will move toward the north and the other half toward the south. And I'll pour out on the house of David, not Zechariah, I'll pour down the house of David on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication, so that they will look on me. They will see Jesus when he returns. They will look on him who they pierced and they will mourn for him. When they see him return, they will know this is our Messiah and we missed it. We missed it. But they'll mourn and they'll repent as one who mourns for his only son. And they'll weep bitterly over him like bitter weeping over a firstborn. All of Israel will be saved. They see him and they will repent and they'll see who he is. And he will defeat Lucifer and his return. The Antichrist and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire. This is no fight at all. He just comes and he just stops it. The beast was seized and with him the false prophet who performed signs in his presence by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. And these two are thrown alive into the lake of fire with, which burns with brimstone. So they are thrown into this lake of fire and the rest, the rest of these armies that were that were there are killed with the sword which comes out of the mouth of Jesus, out of the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. And so he brings the birds to actually clean up uh, the mess from these people. Lucifer is bound in the abyss for a thousand years. So we see the abyss here is put back in its place as a gel. It was a gel for those demons all this time. And now Lucifer is going to be bound in this abyss again for the next thousand years. And I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key to the abyss and a great chain on his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan. And he bound him for a thousand years and he threw him into the abyss and he shut it and he sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. So now we have, and this is, I thought this was really interesting. There's 75 days between when Jesus returns and sets foot on earth and when in Daniel, it says those who wait and attain are blessed. And I think it's really interesting when we look at what could be happening during this time. So from the time of the regular sacrifice is abolished, this is the abomination that causes desolation. There'll be 1,290 days. So we know Jesus returns at 1,260 days, but Daniel's saying there's an extra 30 days till something. And then there is another 45 days to 1335 where there will be a blessing. So we look at the extra 30 days in the 1290. So from the midpoint, Jesus returns at 1260. And then there's another 30 days that Daniel is talking about. So what could be happening during these 30 days? Um, one thought is that this could be when Jerusalem is lifted up because scripture here says Jerusalem is secured. So this is when Jesus returns. Jerusalem is secured. All the land will be changed into a plain. So God will change the landscape of Jerusalem and he's going to lift um, of Israel and he's going to lift up Jerusalem above everything else. And so during these 30 days, it could be a, a healing and a restructuring of the very lands in Israel. And of course, the people will be in peace. The people will be safe. Um, the earth is restored. You know, we read Ezekiel 47 and we see how God restores the earth through the living water that comes from the temple. And in Zechariah, we hear about it as well. And that day, living waters will flow out of Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea and the other half toward the western sea. It will be in the summer as well as in the winter. 
and the Lord will be king over all the earth. And in that day, the Lord will be the only one and his name, the only one. And so, and so we see here um, during those 30 days, we've got Jerusalem restructured. We've got the earth being restored and we've got the tribulation saints receiving their glorified bodies um, and ruling with Jesus and his bride. Now, this isn't the people that are alive at the end of the tribulation, but this is those that died during the tribulation, the tribulation saints. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony, because of the word of God and those who had not worshiped the beast or his image and not received the mark on their forehead or their hand. And they came to life and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the end of the thousand years until the thousand years were completed so this is the first resurrection there so during these 30 days that could be what's happening and so then daniel goes on to say though that those who keep waiting and attain the 1335 days are blessed so what could that be well there's going to be a judgment of the gentile nations there's going to be a sheep and goat judgment so this is the judgment um, of the sheep and goats. The Gentiles are judged by their treatment of Israel during this time, the tribulation there. Did they follow Jesus? Did they take the mark of the beast? Um, did they help the nation of Israel? Did they help the people? Did they help those that were, that were um, tribulation saints during that time? Or are they goats? Were they following the Antichrist? And so, you know, of course, the armies that were going against Jesus, they're defeated at that moment. But then there are going to be people that survive the tribulation. They're standing at the edge of the millennial reign. But only sheep go into the millennial reign. So when the son of the man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne and before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd she separates sheep from goats. And the king will answer them, truly I say unto you, as you did to the one of the least of my brothers, you did it to me. And so God will judge them during this time. So for those who survive the tribulation and the sheep and goat judgment, those full 75 days remaining until 1335 means they are truly blessed because they're entering the reign of Jesus. The unbelievers will be separated from the believers and they'll be judged later at the great white throne judgment at the end of the millennial reign. And they'll be judged according to their works. That the, the great white throne judgment is only for unbelievers. You do not want to be part of the great white throne judgment. There's absolutely nothing that you can do to earn salvation. That judgment is, is going to be horrible. Uh, the millennial reign of Jesus, this is going to be our new home on earth with Jesus during the millennial reign. So this is a literal thousand year reign of Jesus with believers. We'll be reigning alongside him as kings and priests. Blessed holy is the one who has part in the first resurrection. That's us. We have part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power. We are not going to be in the great white throne judgment. We, there's, there's, no, there's no death. We've, we've passed from death. But they will be priest of God and Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Jerusalem will become the center of earth during this time. And there'll be the fourth temple. The temple described in Ezekiel. And in that day, living waters will flow out of Jerusalem, half toward the east, toward the Dead Sea, and the other half toward the Mediterranean Sea. And that, of course, is going to be the, again, the healing there. Everything's going to come from Jerusalem. Not only is that going to be the center of where all people are gathered to worship God, that'll be where his throne is, but that'll be the center of of the of the life restoration that is all going to come from Jerusalem, the apple of his eye, the center. And so it's a peaceful time of prosperity and long lives. Now it'll come about that in these last days, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains. Again, Israel will be raised up. 
be raised above the hills and all the nations will stream to it. And he will judge between the nations and will render decisions from many people. And they will hammer their swords into plowshares. There'll be no more reason for, for war and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation and never again will they learn war. So this will be a time of peace and prosperity. I will also rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. For there will no longer be heard in her the voice of weeping or the sound of crying. No longer will there be an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not live out his days. For a youth will die at the age of 100 and one who does not reach the age of 100 who misses the mark will be thought accursed. And so here, if you receive Jesus, if you follow Jesus, you continue to live um, very, very long lives. Remember in, in the beginning, Adam and, Lee, and Adam and Eve, they lived just short of a thousand years. Or Adam lived just sh short of a thousand years. And so that long life will be restored to us. And part of that will be the, the, the trees from the Garden of Eden, they'll, they'll, be, they'll be returned. There'll be trees that grow on the banks from these rivers of life that their leaves will be used for the healing of the nations. And so we'll see this this, these pictures from Eden that, that are brought back, even though it's not, the curse isn't completely gone during the millennium, um, long lives are restored. So then Lucifer is released at the end of the millennium, and um, he will actually bring an army against Jerusalem. I think this is just insane that he's able to to do this. But when a thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison. And he'll come out to deceive the nations. So he'll come out and he'll use his old tricks and he'll be able to deceive the nations again, which are in the four corners of the earth. Gog Magog, and this is not the Gog Magog that we see forming now, this, but this is, you see the same powers over those areas. So Gog Magog, there'll be another war of Gog Magog. And they'll gather them together for war to number them as the sand of the seashore. So he's going to be able to amass a giant army and they'll come up on a broad plain of the earth and they'll surround the camp of the saints in the beloved city. So they're going to come around Jerusalem and the fire will come down from heaven and devour them. And so Jesus doesn't play. He doesn't play. He, they, were, they will come up, amass an army. Satan will be talking all kinds of talk. He'll get this army to come up and then Jesus is just going to take them out. He's just not even going to let them attack his people. But we see here that even under the rule of Jesus in perfect circumstances, with the perfect king, human nature will still want to rebel. That there'll be so many people that are still wanting to rebel that it'll be like the sand of a seashore. People that will not want to be under the leadership of Jesus. So at this time, Jesus throws Lucifer into the lake of fire, and this is ending his ability to ever interfere again. So he is, he is destroyed at that time, and he never is able to come back. So uh, the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are also. And they'll be tormented day and night forever and ever. Relation, um, Revelation 2010. So there is an end to Satan. After that, he'll be completely, completely removed. So then we have the great white throne judgment. So this is the judgment that is for all unbelievers. So after this revolt, then there's the great white throne judgment. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. So all of the dead, uh, not in Christ. So all unbelievers ever that ever lived will be resurrected for this judgment. Everyone that rejects Jesus will have a time of trial. They will actually have a time before the judge to see why they, this was them. They'll see why they deserve what happened. 
And this just, this is so hard. Uh, the scrolls will be opened where they'll be able to see the accounts of their life. And the dead will be judged on the things that are written in those books according to their deeds. Now we know all of our deeds are filthy rags. There's nothing that anyone can do to earn eternal life. If they are not found in the book of life, there, there is no hope. And the sea gave up the dead, which is in it. And the death and Hades gave up the dead, which are in them. And they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. And this is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name is not found written in the book of life, it's all about writ being written in the book of life. The only way that you come to the father is through the son. He's thrown into the lake of fire. And that is the end of corruptible. So then there's a new heaven and a new earth. And only believers are going to populate this new heaven, heaven and new earth. We just had the great white throne judgment that removed all corruption from the population. Everyone who ever lived that did not know Jesus has been removed. And now we have a new heaven and a new earth. The, the, um, the heaven and the earth that we know right now is burned up. It's refined by fire. And there's a new heaven and a new earth that's created by God. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered or come to mind. And then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And there's no longer any sea. There's no sea that's needed in this. Um, new Jerusalem will come down to earth. And so New Jerusalem, this will be our home. We'll know this home already. And it's going to come down. This holy city, New Jerusalem, is going to come down from heaven. And it's going to be absolutely beautiful. And this is, this is our home. No temple is needed. I saw no temple for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. There's no need for a temple because we'll be face to face with God. There's no need for a mediation between us and God. There's no death, no mourning, no crying, no pain. So all of that, the curse is completely removed. There's no need for sunlight or moonlight. And the city has no need for sun or moon to shine on it for the glory of God has illuminated it. And its lamb, it, it, its lamp is the lamb. And again, that's a picture. You look back at creation. God created the earth. He, cre he created the earth. He created um, vegetation. He created that. He created the land masses before he created the sun and the moon. And so we see he illuminates it. The curse from Genesis is lifted. There's no longer any curse. There's no longer any death. On either side of the river is the tree of life. There's nothing that's going to keep anyone from being able to eat of the tree of life. And it bears 12 kinds of fruit yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There will no longer be any curse and the throne of the God and the lamb will be in it and the bond servants will serve him. So there'll no longer be any curse. There'll no longer be any, um, any rebellion, that curse of rebellion. And there's no night. There'll no longer be any night and they'll have no need for a light or a lamp. Because God will illumine them and they'll reign forever and ever. As it's written, eye has not seen nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. We can't even grasp and try to imagine what we have in store for us. It's, it's so much bigger than, than we can even imagine. We can, we can somewhat, I can somewhat get my head around maybe the millennial reign a little bit because it's still kind of what we know, but better. But this new heaven and new earth and what we have, I think he's got some surprises for us that are just going to completely blow our mind, completely blow our mind. Uh, but we truly have so, so much uh, to look forward to. So there we have an overview of 
the timeline that we have to look forward to and what uh, will happen in the 